There's a paradox in the Buddha's teachings, where on the one hand he says that admirable friendship is the whole of the holy life, the entirety of the practice. And on the other hand, where he says he's simply one who points out the way. It's up to us to follow the way. The sense of its admirable friendship being the whole doesn't mean that it takes care of everything. It's a necessary prerequisite. As the Buddha said, without him, where would we be? We wouldn't know anything about the path. We wouldn't even know that there was such a path. You read all the strange beliefs that were held in his time. And if it weren't for the Buddha, those would be still around. And many strange beliefs still are around. But the path is available still. And the fact that it's been made available by the Buddha and all the other admirable friends between the Buddha and us, that's what makes it possible for us to practice. So we should have a sense of gratitude for them. But at the same time, we have to realize they can't do the work for us. Because after all, suffering is an inside job. It's something that we're doing to ourselves. And the end of suffering is going to require a skill. In the Buddha's analysis, the causes leading up to suffering all come from ignorance, avijja. The opposite of ignorance, vijja, has two meanings in Pali. One, it means knowledge, and two, it means skill. And that second meaning is really important. As you look at the Four Noble Truths, and there are duties appropriate to each. Suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Cessation is to be realized. And the path to cessation has to be developed. Each of those duties is going to involve skill. Nobody else can make us skillful. They can point out the way, as the Buddha did. They can show us how things are done. But they can't take their skill and put it in our hands or put it in our hearts. That's something we have to do. We have to cultivate the desire to do that. That's why in right effort, the phrase, generating desire, is so important. All things, the Buddha said, are rooted in desire. Suffering is rooted in desire, but the path is also rooted in desire. So desire is not a bad thing. It's simply a question of knowing what kind of desires to encourage and which ones not to encourage. And the desire for awakening also is not a bad thing. All too often you hear the desire for awakening is one thing that gets in the way of our awakening, of seeing our true awakened nature. Which ties you in a knot. You want awakening, but you're not supposed to want it. You think that you would benefit from it, but then there's not supposed to be any you. That kind of thinking, as I said, gets you all tied up. The Buddha is very frank. You need desire in order to come, in order to develop the path, in order to get to the end of desire. That's why desire is not only part of right effort, but it's also the first of the basis of success. There's a passage where Venerable Ananda makes this really clear. A Brahman comes to see him and asks him, what does this path that you're practicing lead to? And Ananda says, well, one of the things it leads to is the end of desire. And what is this path of practice? And Ananda lists the basis for success, starting with desire. And the Brahman says, well, wait, wait a minute. You can't end desire with desire. But then Ananda gives him an analogy to show that you can. He said, before you came to this park where I'm staying, did you have the desire to come? Yes. And that's why you came. But now that you're here, where's that desire? Well, it's gone, 
I don't need it anymore. In the same way you pick up the desire to follow the path. And it will take you to a point where you don't need it anymore. Think of the image of the raft or the image of the relay chariots. They take you to where you want to go and then you put them aside. And then it also has a passage where he talks about craving as being part of the motive energy for the path. He says this body comes into existence through craving, and we're going to be putting an end to craving. But to get there, you have to use craving. In this case, he expresses it as you see that other people have gained awakening, and you have the desire within yourself. I too would like to have awakening. That's craving for becoming. I want to be awakened. Here again, we're often told that thought is going to skew your practice. You're starting with the wrong view that you're going to benefit somehow. But again, Ananda doesn't talk in those ways. He's very frank. You need to have that kind of craving. The desire to want, the desire to be awakened is a legitimate desire to develop. Of course, you develop skillfully. You ask yourself, what are the causes? Well, that's the path. So you develop the path. You don't just sit there hoping to realize the cessation without the path, or think that you can somehow clone awakening without going through the path. The path is a series of, of strategies. It borrows elements of the first noble truth and the second noble truth. This is paradoxical. Because all too often we're told that the path and the goal are the same thing. In other words, you get to the Third Noble Truth by doing the Third Noble Truth, and somehow the Fourth Noble Truth is the Third Noble Truth. And that's not the case at all. The Fourth Noble Truth borrows elements from the first. We cling to the aggregates. Well, you use the aggregates on the path. You focus on the breath to develop a feeling of ease, using a perception of the breath to hold you in place. You employ directed thought and evaluation to settle in, and you're aware of all these things. Well, that's the five aggregates right there, creating right concentration. And then there are four forms of clinging around the aggregates. One of them you don't use, which is craving, <coughs> excuse me, clinging to sensuality. But then there's clinging to habits and practices, clinging to abuse, clinging to doctrines of the self. And so you hold on to the precepts. That's a good set of habits to have. You hold on to the practice of concentration. That's a good practice to have. You hold on to right view. You hold on to your sense of yourself as being someone who's competent to do this and who will benefit from doing it. That's three kinds of clinging. Out of the three kinds of craving, again, you drop craving for sensuality. But the other two are useful. You want to put an end to the you who is suffering, the you who is creating suffering, the you who wants to keep on traveling through samsara. So be craving for non-becoming and craving for becoming. You want to become awakened. Okay, you use that as a motive, motive force in the practice. As you get closer and closer, you're beginning to realize you don't need that anymore. That's when you can let it go. So instead of equating the Fourth Noble Truth or the Third, we actually see in the Fourth Noble Truth we borrow elements of the First and the Second. Because the Third Noble Truth is something totally other. The path requires passion, but the Third Noble Truth, total dispassion. You first start out with dispassion for the First and the Second Noble Truths, and then finally you turn around on the Fourth. Developed his passion for that. And that's how you get there. So we make use of what we got. Think again of that image of the raft going across the river. What's the raft made of? It's not made of the other side. We're trying to go. It's made out of twigs and branches on this side. 
that side where you already are. And it's kind of makeshift, but you do your best to tie it together well. Otherwise, you make use of what you've got. And that will include desire, it will include, include craving. Learn how to foster the skillful forms of desire, the skillful forms of craving. And that will help get you across. So it's your own desire that's going to get you across as you learn to become more and more skillful, thinking about what the Buddha taught about cause and effect, path and goal. So you focus your desires in the right place. So on the one hand, the holy life is totally dependent on the Buddha. On the other hand, it's rooted in desire, like every other dharma. Main sign. Paradoxical, but as you get a sense of the path, you begin to see that it all makes sense. And the Buddha was wise in the way that John Lee would define wisdom. The sort of person who can take almost anything and get good use out of it. The Buddha has no use for sensual craving, no use for sensual clinging. But the other forms of craving and clinging he finds a use for. And it's up to us to figure out how to use those things in a skillful way. So we get inspiration from the Buddha. And that's the sense in which the entirety of the path depends on him, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have any idea that there was a path. But we also have to depend on ourselves. And it's simply a matter of learning how to identify what things within ourselves will be helpful on the path. And don't be surprised to find desire and craving among those things. <laughs>